Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom event. I'm Cindy Talbot, Vice Chair of Print London. And on behalf of our collective, I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's Artist Talk by Jen Law, one of three jurors that recently juried the Ontario Miniature Print Exhibition, TOMP 2022. Print London is hosting tonight's Zoom event from London, Ontario. Before we begin, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we are situated is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lene Paywak peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nations communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island, North America. Print London is an artist collective that was started in 2014 in order to bring together printmakers from London and the surrounding region. The collective is guided by a seven person steering committee and currently has approximately 40 members. In the summer months, we actively program community-based projects printmaking workshops, invited guest speakers, and exhibitions that focus on bringing printmakers in southwestern Ontario together. Though do we, we do not yet have a physical printmaking center, our programming aims to com, com, sorry, our programming aims to create a professional community in order to stimulate the art of print and to explore the print and promote printmaking as an important part of contemporary art. This year we have reached further afield with an international exchange ex exhibition called In Two Places shown concurrently in Barbados and London, and through expanding the Ontario Miniature Print Exhibition to become a national event. The artist talk that we are hosting tonight concludes our programming for the Ontario Miniature Print Exhibition, TOMP 2022. TOMP was founded in 2016 and is now a biennial event that is open to national submissions. Traditionally, TOMP has been juried by two local jurors and one out of town juror. And in pre-COVID editions of the exhibition, uh, we hosted an in-person talk by the out-of-town juror for our London audience at the time of the jurying. For this fourth edition of TOMP, our first national edition, we have moved online to accommodate our national viewership, but continued this tradition of following the run of the exhibition. This year's jurying took place in late July when the three jurors met at Museum London to examine nearly 250 works submitted by 75 artists from across six provinces in Canada. These artists are residents of Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. The jurors, our guest speaker tonight, Jen Law, along with uh, David Bobier, media artist, curator, founder, and director, Fiber Fusion Lab, and Cassandra Getty, curator of art at Museum London, selected 95 works by 60 artists for the exhibition at Satellite Project Space in London, which concluded yesterday. Together, they awarded three prizes and three honorable mentions that were announced at a virtual prize giving event on August 20th. I will now, now ask Jen to turn on her camera and mic while I introduce her to you. Jen Law is an artist, writer, and editor living in Toronto. Working across print, clay, and animation, Law's practice explores book culture, the historical archive library, literary objects, and processes of collection and storytelling through material things. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London, UK, a BA in anthropology from McGill University, Montreal, Quebec, and a BFA from Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. Law has exhibited her work internationally, including exhibitions in Canada, the United States, Australia, Taiwan, Spain, and the United Kingdom. In addition to exhibiting her own artwork, Law has published widely on contemporary art and print culture, and has worked as a lecturer, curator, and editor in Canada, the UK, and South Africa. She is the co-editor with Tara Cooper of Printopolis, published in 2016 by Open Studio, Toronto and in 2017 co-founded Arts and Letters Press with Penelope Stewart, with whom she co-edits the journal Art and Reading. Tonight, Jen will be speaking out about her practice as an artist. Her work is rooted in material storytelling and recent experiments with animation, clay lithography, and letterpress gardening. And we greatly look forward to gaining insight into it. I will hand it over to you, Jen. Thanks, Cindy. Um, hi, everyone. 
Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I'm grateful to Print London and Jocelyn Gardner for inviting me to be a juror for this year's 2022 exhibition and inviting me to speak to you today about my own work and research. And thank you to Cindy as well for hosting the event this evening. I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit more about my background. I'm a visual artist as well as an anthropologist. Um, and as Cindy mentioned in my bio, I studied fine art at Queens, majoring in printmaking, following which I went on to get a second degree in anthropology and ultimately a PhD in anthropology from SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in the UK. My doctoral research focused on discourses of memory and trauma in contemporary installation art and civil society in South Africa, following the end of apartheid in 1994. I've been researching and writing about contemporary South African art and civil society for the past 25 years, as well as writing more broadly on contemporary art and print culture and more recently clay culture. I sometimes joke that I'm a recovering anthropologist, but I'm not recovered at all. The truth is the work I make as an artist is deeply informed by the evolving concepts I research and write about in anthropology. The two are intricately entangled. And for me, this has been the most productive and richest way to work as both a, a writer and an artist. My combined practice is rooted in print and book culture, and I often write and make material things in tandem, engaging writing, reading, and book publishing as material practices in their own right. With this in mind, in 2017, I co-founded an independent project-based publishing platform called Arts and Letters Press with Penelope Stewart, with whom I co-edit co a multidisciplinary journal, Art and Reading. Ultimately, I'm interested in the ways in which we think um, with and alongside materials and their associated technologies and practices. In this, I practice what I would refer to as conceptual materialism, an approach that seeks out the narrative potential of materials. I work with print-based processes very broadly defined, and in the context of Print London, I'll be sharing mostly those print-based processes, but I'll also touch upon material strategies and projects in clay and animation that overlap and happen in parallel to my print practice. I won't get overly theoretical here, but I thought I'd start by framing my talk in relation to the two main strategies I use for material thinking and making. The first is transference, which I've written about specifically in relation to print in books such as Printopolis that I co-edited with Tara Cooper and other publications. I'm interested in processes of transference, not simply as the action of moving an image from a matrix to another surface, but in relation to the exchange of graphic knowledge and the ways in which artists use print-based pedagogies to think about making art. From this perspective, print-based practice is understood not simply as an assortment of technological skills to be acquired and employed, but rather as a set of unique aesthetic and conceptual problem-solving strategies that may be transferred and applied across diverse media. The second strategy is transcription, a process of learning or acquiring material knowledge through acts of mimicry. There's overlap here with processes of translation. However, while translation is looking for equivalences, or at least the illusion of equivalence, transcription is seeking correspondences. Importantly, as much as transcription seeks to learn and uncover new knowledge, it simultaneously admits loss into its process. In transcription, you must decide what information you are willing to let go. And in the process of letting go, other things are gained. I feel that my practice in general has been an exercise in learning to let go. Along these lines, one theme I'm consistently engaged is the evolution of technology, of reading and writing specifically. In response to debates surrounding the so-called crisis in print, I created two related objects in 2014, a book and a printing press using 3D printing technology. Artifact is a replica of a volume by Edmund C. Berkeley, an American computer scientist who wrote one of the earliest popular pop publications on computers in 1949 called Giant Brains or Machines That Think. The book is open to chapter 11 in which Berkeley imagines what the social impact of computers will be for human humanity. While it appears to be an actual book, it's rather a carefully constructed illusion of a book. The top pages are printed on a surface, but do not turn. The book is open, but cannot close. Although technically printed, 
It is in fact unreadable beyond the surface. It exists solely as an art object, an artifact. As a book, it's redundant. Reinventing the Wheel is a 3D printed miniature fully functioning printing press designed from blueprints for a full size intaglio press. Here, a contemporary printing technology is used to reproduce a, uh, uh, um, a contemporary printing technology is used to reproduce a traditional printing technology. The work is in effect a print that prints prints. The plate is written in binary code, which translates as print rules. It's a self-perpetuating object, referencing an evolution in print culture that does not signal extinction, but rather perpetuation. Pharmacy builds upon this body of 3D printed works, both as an apothecary and a library. It's a collection of 100 3D printed ink bottles, each filled with the ash of a book once banned or censored. Historically, some of the earliest ink was made from combining carbon ash, lamp black, and water with a binder such as hide glue or gelatin and shellac. Holding the potential for ink, pharmacy anticipates new narratives written from those that have come before. While book, mash, while book ash may conjure images of censorship, its potential to be transformed into ink ultimately proclaims the futility of such attempts at erasure. Pharmacy is a work of loss and regeneration, speaking to the persistence of knowledge beyond the printed text. This interest in what survives from the ashes eventually led to a project called Extant, in which I considered the legacies of three celebrated authors across different time periods. Virgil, Emily Dickinson, and Franz Kafka, who all requested in their wills that their unfinished works, notes, and correspondences be burned upon their deaths. In each case, their work was spared. I imagined finding artifacts of these authors seemingly rescued from the flames. They appear to be partially destroyed or a near absence. The project taps into my anxiety around things left undone and deliberates on the lives of our works beyond us and the will of the artists literally and figuratively. Here I draw on the Latin epic poem, the Aeneid written by Virgil between 29 and 19 BCE. It tells the story of the Trojan hero Aeneas who flees the, the fall of Troy and helps to find, found Rome. During a trip to Greece where he traveled to revise the Aeneid, Virgil caught a virus. Before he died en route home, he left a request that his unfinished manuscript be burned. However, the Emperor Augustus ordered Virgil's executors to ignore this request and to publish it with as few changes as possible. I replicated the Aeneid in its contemporary published form, burning a copy of the book to the point that it sits between survival and extinction, and then carefully replicating the burned book lithographically, turning it into a votive icon of sorts. Turning to Emily Dickinson, she requested that upon her death, her younger sister Lavinia burn all her surviving correspondence, as well as a trove of over 1700 poems. Here, I lithographically reproduced three of Dickinson's envelope poems to scale, meticulously matching and hand printing the color of the paper and the ink with reference to copies, high res facsimile plates from the publication, The Gorgeous Nothings. These are effectively faithful copies of copies that I then partially burned before framing so that they can be viewed from both sides. Finally, for the Kafka pieces, I burned the pages of his blue octavo notebooks that he wrote between 1917 and 1919. Before he died in 1924, Kafka asked that his close friend and literary executor, Max Broad, burn all his unfinished works, notes, and correspondences, which would have included the castle, the trial, and America, but Broad ignored this. The blue notebooks composed mainly of aphorisms and fragments was one of the last things to be published posthumously, appearing in English in 1991. I burned out parts of the text with a pyrographic pen, leaving behind words to make new poems. This strategy for writing is often referred to as erasure poetry, but I have come to call them residue poetry, emphasizing rather what survives and what is left behind. Once again, I lithographically reconstructed the burn pages layer by layer, leaving an illusion of the burn. 
On the note of loss, some of my most important material lessons have been learned through photolithography, often in collaboration with custom printer Pudi Tong, with whom I've worked closely for the past decade. Photolithography has taught me how to look closely and let go of extraneous detail. In 2017, I was invited to participate in a project called Line and Verse, curated by Carlina Chen. 21 Canadian artists and 21 Taiwanese artists were given a choice of three Canadian poems and three Taiwanese poems and were asked to choose one of each and create two works on paper in response to those choices. I chose a poem by Canadian poet Anne Carson called TV Men, Socrates, and a poem by Taiwanese poet Quang Chung Yu called Nostalgia. I wanted to make work that created a correspondence between the two poems, but was not illustrative of them. Rather, I wanted them to share a common visual language as they both deal with similar themes of mortality and loss. Anne Carson's poem is a contemporary take on the story of the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, dealing with his trial and resulting death sentence for impiety and the corruption of youth. Quang Chung Yu's poem, Nostalgia, tells a story of homesickness and past lives remembered through objects. I created two lithographs based on the still life tradition of vanitas, a means of symbolic storytelling through an arrangement of objects that speak to the transience of life and the ephemerality and futility of material accumulation. I'm sharing the original photographs from this project to speak to the loss and the gains involved in photolithography. One learns to let go of certain details, and in exchange, one gets a depth of tone and feeling. To, refer, uh, to return to transcription for a minute, I should mention that one of the reasons I'm so often drawn to working monochromatically is that it allows me to focus on form, to hone in on certain details with a different emphasis, um, and it can also give the illusion of antiquity. However, I also love a good CMYK challenge, which I occasionally turn to as an antidote of sorts. Um, in this case, I'm, I've decided to share um, the CMYK project of this, um, replicating this vase of flowers, a version of which I just showed in the Vanitas images. Um, on the right is Pudi Tong, um, registering the yellow layer of the CMYK print and the cyan layer and magenta. And really it's partially just an excuse to show a print reveal because who doesn't like a good print reveal? But it's also um, a way of talking about when things don't meet one's expectations and how when we follow our expectations and the rule book, in this case, the, the, the sort of CMYK um, a printing straight from the tin, one doesn't always get what you're wanting or expecting. So in this case, um, this was the result, the initial result of the first proof, which is, has its own merits in some ways, I suppose, but it's very heavy. Um, it wasn't at all um, the lightness I was looking for or the, the, the antique feeling that I was looking for that I, I get from the sepia prints. And so we went back to the drawing board and then this was the result. Um, inventing our own CMYK, tweaking all the colors and letting go of expectations, working more on intuition. So this vase of flowers became one of the few color images included in an ongoing project called Still, which was originally exhibited as an installation at Loop Gallery in Toronto in 2018. Still builds a biographical narrative through the social life of heirlooms. The work was originally inspired in part by the writing of Gustave Felt Flaubert particularly his novella, A Simple Heart, and his realist approach to constructing narrative worlds through detailed descriptions of discrete objects in domestic spaces. Printed on tissue-thin Gampy paper and transparently layered, each storied artifact is printed at a one-to-one -one scale, ethereal por portraits of personal heirlooms from my own collection. Presented in the form of an artist book, the volumes designed to evolve, the signatures left unbound so that new object pages may be added to the collection and potentially rearranged by the reader. So these are some of the signatures, um, each uh, being viewed on a light table that was custom made for the installation. 
However, I think perhaps the most conceptually successful aspect of this project occurs in an offshoot. Accompanying the book, the heirloom simultaneously appeared as individual works of printed ephemera, ghosted objects intended to be gifted or folded away into books or drawers, distributed into the world beyond the confines of the original collection and the artist. Many are taken with me when I travel and left anonymously in library books for unwary readers to adopt into their own collections or not, I'll never know. Approached as a deconstructed Vanitas arrangement, the project explores the capacity of objects to create social meaning and connection through material trajectories. And then the pandemic hit. And without access to the print facility, facilities at Open Studio, I'm forced to shift gears. I started working with some raw clay that I had in my studio, mostly out of a desire to just touch something materially. I'd been working in ceramics for about six years in the background of my print practice without really conceptually connecting the two until last year. I also signed up for a virtual studio, studio session at AV Projects, a Los Angeles-based project space founded by artist Nicole Seisler, focused on conceptual clay practice. It was exactly what I had been looking for. These sessions are not set up as instructional classes or workshops, but rather as think tanks of sorts, a space to make alongside other artists in conversation. I set myself the goal of participating in every studio session for a year, treating the experience as a fieldwork exercise of sorts. As with print, I'm specifically interested in the material qualities of clay that lend itself to storytelling and the overlaps and intersections between print and clay cultures, particularly with regards to the history and origins of writing. During this time, my collaboration with Pudi likewise shifted further into the digital realm. We began a material correspondence based largely in animation, mine mostly analog video and stop motion, his and 3D modeling software. Building on this, I invited Pudi to take part in a shared reading of a series of papers written by Italo Calvino for the 1985 Norton Lecture Series at Harvard. Each memo centers on a quality that Calvino deemed essential to writing, lightness, quickness, exactitude, visibility, multiplicity, and consistency. Though Calvino died before the lectures were delivered, all but the last were completed. So this is um, part of that project. Um, this is the memo on visibility. Pudi's contribution is on the right, um, using 3D modeling software um, to uh, create the shadow play. Um, and mine is on the left, where I wrote in water on a raw clay tablet. Um, until and the, the water disappears is absorbed by the clay as it's being written. The project, Six Memos, is an animated correspondence about making transcription and the porous boundaries between the material and the digital. The collaborative project was commissioned as part of the latest issue of Art and Reading, the theme of which is Evolve. The issue has unfolded in two parts. Firstly, over Instagram, which I'm sharing part of it here, and subsequently in print, and the printed issue will be launched this fall. For this mul um, memo, Multiplicity, Calvino focused in part on the quest for a book or library of everything and consequently of nothing. As I've mentioned, I'm interested in the social, historical, and conceptual correspondences between print and clay cultures. This includes the overlapping roles of such technologies in the origins of written language and books. The earliest books, for example, were not written on paper, but rather inscribed in cuneiform on clay tablets. Cuneiform is considered the world's earliest written form of language, originating around 3400 BC. Here, I'm writing out a short text in cuneiform backwards into a raw clay tablet, and then I use it as a matrix for printing. The text translates as return to the mother, which also happens to be the earliest known um, reference to the concept of liberty, written reference. Um, referencing a return to our origins. 
a return to our first stories. I'll speed up the video slightly, but as you can see, I'm filling in um, the inscribed lines with water and then overlaying paper. to get a print. And then here are the 40 outtakes it took for me to get that one video. And I'm including them here because in the context of creating a library of everything, I think one must include all of the things, all of the proofs, all of the things that don't make it into an archive normally, um, all of the mistakes en route to getting to where we think we're going. At the same time, I was spending a lot of time in one place, as we all were, walking in the forest that surrounds my family's farm northwest of Toronto, and increasingly thinking of such daily routines and rituals as an essential part of my practice. Central to this has been collecting, documenting, and reproducing found scripts and echo echoisemic forms in clay and print. That is forms that resemble script or written language in nature, but without semantic meaning. I'm fascinated by our instinct to read the world as text. On the left um, are some of the branches that I've collected and arranged as if they're text. And on the right um, are my clay transcriptions of those forms. that then sometimes got turned into animations and then eventually into prints on the right that were layered and cut out um, in washi paper. Here are some more of the prints. I'm gonna go through um, this somewhat quickly, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the sorts of uh, ways that I've, I've been playing with language, um, particularly over the last couple of years. And, um, using transcription as a strategy for um, creating correspondences across clay and print and animation. This body of work is an attempt to seek out non-human language, creating a totemic alphabet of sorts from found branches and clay that I transcribed into clay slip drawings, for example, and ultimately into print. Here's a process shot of that. and all animations. And here's some other examples where I've made forms, in this case, uh, clay ear votive um, that I've then printed and cut out and then they appear um, in various um, animations. And I use these kinds of forms over and over. So the images are constantly being um, made and unmade. This is a still from a video that I'll show you in a moment. Um, similarly, these are clay, um, raw clay knuckle bones that I made during a studio session at AB Projects um, that I then documented and turned into prints. And similarly with these wishbones, and then the knuckle bones become the soil um, and the wishbones become the branches of the tree. Um, and this is a still of a video that you can see here. These are three different videos using the same elements in different ways. Um, on the right hand, obviously, I've projected one of the videos onto a tree. Um, it's sort of a, an experiment of something um, I want to do more of uh, with these sorts of animations in the forest and on other surfaces. And then eventually, I returned to the print studio to make and test clay-based lithography inks. The plan is to print an artist book I've been working on using these experimental processes. The book is based on the classical Greek myth of Danae, the mother of Perseus. It's inspired by a poem fragment that you see on the screen written by the ancient Greek poet Simonides, which focuses on a moment that Danae and her infant son have been cast out to sea in a sealed box by her father, Chryseus, following a cryptic prophecy which foretells his death at the, end, uh, at the hands of his grandson. This fragment of poetry captures an intimate moment between Danae and her son, 
where she's whispering into his ear, revealing his um, calm and her panic. My book is a material memoir of sorts, focused on the themes of prophecy and motherhood while drawing conceptually and materially on the relationship between earth and water. Um, I tend to like books that spill out of the pages and these are sort of parts of the story told um, outside of the book. Uh, these clay ear votives. Um, the ear was actually the very first thing I made in raw clay um, when I started turning toward to raw clay in the, during the pandemic. Um, and these are examples of me leaving them in places and letting them dissolve into the environment. So on the left is the stream um, at our farm and, and I would leave them in, in trees as well. Um, and I even took one traveling with me um, to France recently and left it behind to dissolve. Um, and this is an example of, of making the ink, uh, making the clay ink. So unlike other um, types of working with lithography and clay, where clay is really the receptive surface for usually a transfer-based process onto that surface, I'm using clay as the medium itself for printing. Um, so it's, it's um, powdered clay that I muddle um, and combine with uh, litho um, transparent base and a bit of varnish and on the right is how it rolls up and you can see that the clay doesn't really want to fully integrate it wants to hold on to itself um, which I quite like actually in a way and it ends up printing um, in a very delicate way so these are just proofs um, none of the images for the book have been finalized yet but we Pudi and I have really just been experimenting with um, both learning just how the clay is going to react, what we can get with different clay bodies, um, what the balance is with the transparent base and the varnish, et cetera, and how it behaves differently from normal ink. And it does behave differently from normal ink um, or not normal oil-based ink, inks that we've used before. Um, and it will be printed on misugami washi, which is infused with gofen or seashell powder. I love a story where the very processes and materials themselves embody the narrative. <clears throat> and lithography is a perfect medium for this telling, for it's a process of balance. Based on the principle that oil and water do not mix, a memory of an oil-based image is fixed to a stone or a plate using chemicals and water. Water is key to the balancing act. Too much water and the oil-based ink cannot stick to the image, too little and the ink consumes the image altogether. Clay and water have a similar relationship based on balance. Too much water and the earth is completely dissolved. Too little and there's nothing but dust. Both are capable of holding the trace memory of the other in an almost molecular level. Um, this is an abalone shell that I had <clears throat> originally drawn in clay slip on the left um, and then transcribed into lith uh, a lithographic print. And on the right um, is actually an heirloom from the heirloom project that I'm, um, I'm including uh, as part of this book, but printed um, in clay ink. And then this is another proof from the same um, series. And another abalone shell, this time photographically reproduced um, uh, and then into um, clay lithography. Uh, but we're proofing here different clay bodies um, and adding mica to try to get a shimmer to um, the print uh, in the hopes of possibly um, perhaps try attempting a, a form of a CMYK print eventually. Um, and it occurs to me that although this is quite a different body of work than my totemic tree alphabets and figures and animations, it's equally about performative processes of storytelling, specifically in relation to themes of loss and atonement. So the final um, body of work that I'm going to share with you um, is happening on the sidelines of this uh, I, when I've turned my attention to other forms of uh, material poetry. And the piece on the screen is a sort of bridge work of sorts because it's printed on abalone shell, which, of course, I just showed you appeared in the prophecy book. Um, abalone shell is sometimes also known as ear shells. Um, so here we're, um, this, these are sheets of abalone that um, is sold usually for jewelry makers. And um, we backed it with washi so that when the, the 
print goes through the press, the letter press, um, it holds its form, the, the, the shell rather doesn't shatter, it holds its form, um, the paper supports it. Um, and these are the proofs of that process. But this wasn't the starting point for this project. This was. Um, back in the spring, I thought I would like to try a little experimentation with um, some found magnolia petals um, that I brought into the studio to try to hand impress using metal type. But when I showed up to the studio that day, Pudi said, hey, we have a new acquisition of a small vintage linoscribe press originally used for letter press printing, uh, proofing rather. So that's what we started to use and experiment with different surfaces on plant materials. So this was the first um, experiment on magnolia. And I included the video in the middle because it shows magnolia petals are obviously quite fleshy and they bruise very easily, especially when they're off the bloom. Um, and in this case, the video shows how quickly it bruises. So when it first comes off the press, you almost don't see the print at all or the, the impression at all rather. Um, and within less than a minute, it bruises. And then over time continues to, to bruise. Um, so these are some of the little proofs. And on the right is the resulting print. So um, even though the print wasn't really my main objective at the beginning, it's interesting to see how each of these materials ends up um, printing as, a, as the type um, impresses into, um, into the petals, for example, and onto the backing paper, um, the pigment that, that results in this, this sort of impressed proof on the right. This is uh, a variation printing on um, uh, birch bark uh, with no ink, just impression. And on, on the left, you can see a glimpse of the, how small the press is um, setting up the type. These are on Japanese maple leaves. Um, these in some ways were the most successful prints in terms of their clarity. Um, and it's nice that you get the ombre effect um, of the pigment of the leaf, both the red and the, and the green together. And then preserving these, of course, in books on the right. And then I wanted to try printing living plants, plants that hadn't, leaves that hadn't just fallen, but, but the entire plant roots and all. Um, so I uprooted some, um, weeds from my garden. And here they are on the left waiting patiently to be printed. And you can glimpse a little press in the background. And on the right um, is after they've been printed and replanted in the pots. Um, this is a, um, a proof to show you just of a little leaf of, of the weeds, but to show you that different leaves produce quite different um, prints. Uh, in this case, the weeds are quite fibrous. So you get this very blurry print. Um, and then on the right is a fully printed um, weed uh, with the full poem um, just before it's replanted back into the earth. And this is a glimpse of what it looks like to try to wrangle um, living plants into this tiny press. Uh, so we obviously can't detach the leaves and you wanna keep the thing alive and, and the roots attached and it takes some manipulation. Um, and you have to keep the rest of the leaves and the stems and everything from going under the roller. And it's pretty much a two person job most of the time. So this is just a little example of how um, one manipulates that in the press. <clears throat> and then this is when they're replanted back into the garden. And I'm showing you this because it's really a kind of living poetry, a, a, a collaborative poetry in which um, I write a poem and print it onto, the, onto um, the leaves or the plants, and then they take over the process. They take over the editing from me um, from there and it's out of my hands. Um, so in this case, these are two different leaves printed with the same text, but each leaf kind of edits its text differently. So on the, on the left, it's preserved some of the letters um, from this little phrase. And on the right, it's, it's completely the, the, uh, the words have basically collapsed right out of the leaf, almost like insect damage. And with the weed poem, something interesting happened. Um, I had replanted them into the garden and I was actually at the studio one day um, when uh, we have a, had a gardener come to clean up a bunch of leaves from our garden. 
And even though the weed poems are planted into a pot um, separate from the, the rest of the garden with other potted things, um, when I returned home that day, I found that he had weeded out all my weed po poems, which at first made me a bit sad. Um, but then I found it quite humorous, actually, that it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you want to write about being uprooted, then you can expect, I suppose, to be uprooted. Um, so I went back into the studio, uprooted more weeds from my garden, um, brought them back into the studio, and we, we, we reprinted them again. Um, I just altered the text slightly to read Burying Myself Again in the Earth. And on the right is... Um, the second round of weed poetry um, after a couple of weeds of uh, weeks rather of editing themselves. Um, these are monsteras, uh, a different variation on printing living plants. So the mon monstera plant was much too large to bring into the studio. So I made clippings of it that um, I've been rerouting. Um, the monsteras print really well. Uh, they're very fleshy leaves, so you get a really great print from them, a really a great impression on the leaves. And they also hold on to the text quite nicely. Um, so these are examples of how they've added the text. The one on the right is, is the one that has disappeared the most, but I quite like how certain letters have disappeared and how they isolate the text like it's a disease um, from the rest of the healthy living leaf. So these are um, doing really well in terms of rooting and will probably be ready to replant into the in, into the pots um, pretty soon. And then um, these ones, uh, the last ones I'm going to show you are oak leaves um, still attached to the branch. Um, and again, oak leaves are pretty fibrous, so the print you get is a little um, not so crisp. And then the variation of this is um, I took oak leaves and gilded them with 24 karat gold and um, formed them into a funerary wreath of sorts, um, sort of drawing on Hellenistic traditions of, of um, gold wreaths um, that were made in the form of, of oak leaves often or ivy and then placed in tombs um, for important people. It's sort of a play. I mean, they didn't use real leaves like I'm using here. They they replicated the leaves in gold. Um, but I like the way that the leaf, uh, the gold preserves the leaf, but also it plays on the idea of gilding the lily, which is really the futility of trying to make something that's already beautiful, more beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna end here. Um, and the last slide I'm going to share um, is just these, uh, an ear votive. These are three outtakes of a video that I made of the ear votive dissolving itself and it's listening in the stream at our farm. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jen, for sharing your practice with us tonight. It was really interesting and enjoyable. Uh, as Jen mentioned, if anyone has questions, she'll take them now. Uh, there are two ways that you can pose your question, verbally or through the chat feature. Uh, additionally, I should mention that there might be people viewing through Facebook Live. If you are on Facebook Live, just type your um, question into the chat box there. And Gosha, hopefully you're there and can relay that question. Um, if you wanna ask your question verbally, you need to raise your hand, your Zoom hand, and I'll call upon you in order. To do that, you click on the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then you click the raise hand. Uh, if you wanna ask your question through the chat feature rather than going on camera, just click the chat button at the bottom of your window and type the question in. Um, just type it to all rather than one person so that there's no duplication of questions. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to orient yourselves and I'll start calling on people as the questions pop up. We got a comment from Stephanie. She said, thank you, this is fascinating. I agree, Stephanie, it was really super interesting. 
Thanks, Stephanie. I'm not sure if you see this from Irina Sheska. I never can say this right. Shesta Kowich. Encore, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Irina. So I'm not sure if you can see this. Danielle Callahan sent a message. I feel like I was just on a residency on your farm and in my mind. Do you have any, <laughs> do you have any works from when you were very young? I'd love to hear about any books or poetry from then. Um, thanks, Danielle. Uh, yeah, I, I've been making art since I was very young. Um, and I did write poetry, but I, I, you know, I, I think it's one of those things that not that one outgrows at all, but maybe that one becomes more self-conscious about calling yourself a poet. Um, and I feel like in a way I'm in doing the, these most recent material poems, I'm reclaiming that for myself in some way. But also I've, I've realized that in printing them on plants or printing them in this way, in this material way in particular, I feel like it, um, it, it feels as, like a safer space in a way that it, it, it doesn't feel like I'm making claims beyond myself and doing it this way. I don't know if that makes sense, but that it is more in my comfort zone. And then the materials themselves or the plants themselves become collaborators in that process in some way. Um, so it feels more like it's a conversation perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like as I was putting together this, this presentation, I realized that so much of my work has drawn somewhat unconsciously, because I haven't really thought about it as, as a recurring event, but very much is recurring that I continuously draw on poetry um, in reading and making work around, um, not, only, not always my own, but sometimes my own. Fantastic. I've got another question here, Jen, from Elizabeth Engel. She says, hi, Jen, wonderful presentation of fabulous work. Did you burn reproductions or original books? How did that feel? Um, I burned books, none, no, no originals, um, inter, you know, obviously. Um, but yeah, I burned books and it felt very strange at first. But I sort of got used to the process in doing the, the 3D printed apothecary library pharmacy um, because it required that I burn a hundred books in my backyard, um, which I kept very secret because I, I felt like that's the last thing you want your neighbors to see <laughs> is you burning books in your backyard. Um, so it felt very like, yeah, it felt very secretive that whole process. And there was shame, I think, involved for me um, and, and as someone who's very, can be very precious about my library, um, I think at first it, it, it was, it was really difficult to enact violence on, on, on books, but I, at the same time, the more one, the more I did it, um, the more I reconciled why I was doing it and what it was about and, and the allure of making ink from those books that it wasn't really a destruction it was more of a reinvention it was more again a correspondence or a conversation um, with those writings um, so yeah so for, for in different projects I've burned things in different ways like the M the Emily Dickinson um, lithographs I burnt the actual lithographs and that was really hard because I realized if I if I if I made a mistake I might lose the whole lithograph which you know, took quite some time to to make. So, yeah, I I burn I burn different things in different ways. Is the answer to that question? <laughs> Super. I've got a few other comments that came in, uh, and then I think another question. So this one's from Julie Moose. I so, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, Julie. This was so thought provoking. Lots to comp contemplate. Thank you, Jen. And then. Mm -hmm. From Jocelyn Gardner, the depth of your conceptual and material explorations is intense, yet so playful. I enjoyed your talk thoroughly, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Jocelyn. And we've got another comment from Robert Anderson. You're totally amazing, Jen. I wish I had a teacher like you along the way. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, then I've got a comment and question from uh, Gosia Martiniak. She says, combining printmaking and craft is a great interest of mine. 
Have you ever been interested in more ways of utilizing print in clay or clay and print, like slip printing? Um, yeah, I am interested, and I, 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 I'm sure I'll do a lot more of experimentation. Um, at the moment, I think because I work so much um, in collaboration with Pudi in in photolithography, it seemed like really that was um, I wanted to lean into that more than anything else. I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was making um, prints directly from clay, much in, in the way that I demonstrated with the cuneiform, for example, playing with it that way. Um, but I haven't really tried transfer processes before. This is, I, I haven't, um, a lot of this is with raw clay, so that's that that's part of it. But in terms of the, the artist book that I'm working on, it was really important to me that that clay was telling the story, that clay was um, embodying the story in a certain way. So I didn't want it just to sit on the surface. I wanted it to be integrated in, in even the paper um, being, uh, the choice of paper um, being part of that storytelling process. Um, but yes, I'm open to all sorts of, of, of um, future experiments with printing um, um, with clay and using um, print and, and, and across other media as well. Super. I've got a couple of other comments here. Uh, and also, if you have more questions, type them into the chat. So this one's from Sandy Collins. She says, thank you for the journey into your world. Beautiful. Thank you. And then another comment from Gary Smith. And his says, I think from creation to cremating, question mark. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a really good tagline. <laughs> I may borrow that. <laughs> I'm making uh, an exhibition title. Uh, Goshia entered some claps, so she's very appreciative of what you're doing. Uh, then we have another comment from Pudi. He says, that was breathtaking, winky face. <laughs> Even though I have already seen some of the work beforehand, we were there. And then in quotations, just normal people doing normal things in the studio. Yep, just normal people doing normal people things. <laughs> and then Gary has an additional comment. Well, maybe creation to cremation. Yeah, <laughs> it works either way, I think. <laughs> Super. Is there anything else? Does anyone else have any other co comments or questions? All right. Well, I think that that's it. So let me cue myself up here. All right. So finally, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors for their generous contributions towards the success of 2022. Fanshawe College School of Design, London Arts Council through the City of London's Community Arts Investment Program, Museum London, and Satellite Project Space. So I wanna say goodnight to everybody and thank you for joining us. And thank you especially for, to Jen for that wonderful talk. And I hope everybody has a good evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>